<laughs> Thanks to the organizers. It's great to be here. See a lot of old friends. I, um, I arrived here like 5 a.m. New York time because my flight was delayed. <laughs> so I have some nice English breakfast tea uh, to, uh, in spite of the four hours of sleep, to give a coherent talk. <laughs> Um, and I'm going to tell you about some recent work we've been doing on uh, developing new algorithms for analyzing high-throughput um, protein DNA interaction profiling data from CELLEX uh, experiments. Uh, and this is a collaboration uh, with Richard Mann and uh, Rima Rose. Um, um, we have a, a grant together uh, to, to do this work. Um, um, and I'm, I'm going to start by just pointing to an, a paper from almost 10 years now ago the Mitomi paper by Merkel and Quake, where they use microfluidics to measure KDs for, for a large number of sequences. And what you see here is actually, um, let's see if I can find the pointer, um, is um, the, the full raw data for two different helix loop helix uh, transcription factors from yeast. It happens, but it doesn't really matter. They're different factors, and this is on a log scale. The, uh, the KD or the, the binding free energy for different sequences. And what, what they did in this paper is they used only this in vitro measurements, combined it with the human or with the yeast genome, all the promoter sequences, to predict which genes are the targets of these two different transcription factors, one at a time. And, and then, then when they got their top targets and they scored for enrichment of genotology categories, uh, and actually here, the same color is used for very different Go categories in panel A and B. So <laughs> maybe the point is that these are very different from these, you know, even though the top category is green. But if you, you know, keep that in mind, um, it's very amazing if you think of it. It's, if you look at these profiles, it's pretty much the same for both factors. They like to bind to an E box, right? There's some differences. But if you eyeball these profiles, you would say they kind of have the same preferences, right? But if you use these data in a quantitative way with the actual genome sequence and nothing else, no empirical measurements of gene expression or, or binding, just the genome sequence and these affinities, and then try to predict what the genes are, you get qualitatively different predictions in what kind of pathways are controlled by these two factors from these quantitative subtle differences between these factors. And that's what's motivated a lot of, um, of our research is, is to try and capture these subtle but important functional differences between close paralogs of transcription factors from the same family and see if we can, you know, by doing rigorous modeling of, um, of the high throughput data, we can actually capture those functional differences uh, just in terms of the in vitro binding specificity of those factors. Um, and over the last years, we've been working a lot with a, a type of Celex data, um, you know, we call Celex Seq, which uses EMSA gels which are different from doing solution-based uh, measurements, uh, such as in HD solex in that you can isolate complexes of, say, heterodimer um, transcription factors binding to DNA. Right? You start with a random pool, you sequence that, then you cut out the bound DNA from the EMSA gel after a round of selection. You can actually iterate this, but uh, you can also do just one round. Um, and then you sequence the, the selected pool as well, and from the statistical differences between those two pools, you can somehow, you know, do motif discovery, right? And what we um, did in this paper, which was a you know, paper with, with Remo and, and Richard and, uh, and Barry Honig at the time, um, we developed a, um, a, a method for Kamer enrichment. Um, this is a former postdoc in the lab, Todd Riley, um, and this has actually recently been re-implemented uh, very efficiently by grad student in my lab, Chitanya Rostogi, and it's a bioconductor package that does this in seconds on the, on the MacBook Air. Uh, but you can basically count uh, KMERS in your round zero pool and in the selected pool, and then score the enrichment, normalize it to a score from zero to one, right? So every KMER gets an enrichment score, the best highest affinity KMER gets a score of one, background binding is close to zero, right? Uh, and you can summarize the experiment this way. What is the drawback of this is that, you know, each KMER is scored independently, right? So you don't capture the relationships between those KMERs, actually different shifted versions of them. Um, and ideally, you would like to understand the relationship between these KMERs in terms of features such as, you know, base uh, uh, presence of an A at some position or, or even uh, base uh, parameters like the ones that, that Remo's uh, been really um, 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 focusing on and make, making us all aware of. Um, so in general, you would like to model protein DNA interaction with some kind of biophysical model in terms of the concentration of the protein and AKD that, uh, you know, is the binding um, models the, the uh, interaction, the strength of the interaction between, between the protein and the DNA. Um, 
And if you have some optimal sequence and you make a mutation, you get a change in the affinity that's basically e to the power of the difference in free energy, right? Um, and, of course, you know, there's sequences in the genome that are more than one mutation away from the optimal side. Um, and if you want to model those, you have to make an assumption that maybe you can add up the free energy contributions from those different features that you perturb. And this can be generalized to dinucleotides or, or you know, include uh, DNA shape parameters as well. Okay. So if you, this is just a little overview of, of, of some approaches to trying to fit such you know, base feature-based models uh, for protein-binding microarray data, such as the type that uh, Martha Bullock's lab has really pioneered. Um, Right, if you, um, Gary Stormo, long time ago, uh, right, uh, already did regression modeling of measured KDs, right? They measured KDs with, with MSOS, and then they tried to explain those, uh, those, the variation in KD over sequences in terms of base features, and basically fit delta delta G like parameters uh, with linear regression. Uh, and then, you know, uh, 20 years later, uh, my lab formulated an algorithm where basically we model the PBM intensities as a sliding window sum of such a model uh, uh, over the PBM probes. And then more recently, this has been tailored uh, both in Gary's lab and mine uh, and by other people as well but to, um, to, um, to model PBM data and capture some of the positional dependencies there. Right? But the idea is that you can infer these delta delta G like parameters from the data by fitting this nonlinear model to, to, the, to the raw data using the data from all the probes at the same time. Uh, now, if you think of where we are with the, you know, equivalent or analog development of algorithms for CELEX, feature-based models of uh, CELEX, um, so far uh, we've had very successful applications, uh, for instance, by, by Remo's lab with Martha Bullock, and, and we've been a little involved with that as well, um, where if you know where the binding window is, you know, and so you can basically align sequences and then you get a score um, of their enrichment from these Kamer table-like approaches, you can try to dissect that in terms of of base and shape features, and you know, that gives very good insights. What is not captured uh, yet is the fact that, of course, the factor can bind anywhere in the Celex probe, right? And so, so doing something analogous to taking the sum over the whole probe and then fitting these parameters, that's something we've been working on uh, very actively in the last couple of years. And I want to show you um, the results from two different algorithms, one of which is a, an approximate algorithm um, and that is implemented in R that we've used for a couple of different... I'm just trying to make sure I understand yeah. the previous slide. So the, sure. The, the sum I just... That's basically just the partition function for one sequence. That's just for physics, no? Right. That's yeah. I. Well, the sum is actually a sliding window sum over views on the single sequence. Right? So... Right. So that's an approximation to... to well, it's an approximation in the sense that there's no saturation of binding. Right, so the, the average number of yeah. protein molecules bound to the longer DNA sequences to first order is the sum of the affinities. Phi is over what? Phi is our features. For instance, having an A at position 3 or the minor group width at position 5. Right, so the idea is that the total free energy is the sum over all these features and then a coefficient that measures the effect size for every feature. Uh, and you now you can exponentiate that you get an affinity or a Boltzmann factor. Right? Um, so depending on whether you take the log or not, it's either additive or multiplicative. But that's, that's a, you know... It's when you slide these windows, do you allow overlaps on certain... Um, yeah, these windows are overlapping. Because in principle... Well, we look at every window, every possible view on the sequence. Because the idea is that the concentration of the protein is low enough that, that most of the time there's just one protein bound to the sequence. You can actually, with transfer matrix methods, you can, you know, deal exactly with, you know, with... Uh, with the situation where, when there's when you have some saturation and competition with between different binding sites, and uh, but but that's computationally more uh, you know uh, intensive, but it doesn't really get you a lot um, in terms of performance of the methods. Okay, so and of course you know if you have a sum, you can take the log to go from a sum to a product, right? And so it doesn't matter uh, in this case, but if you have a sum of a product, which really this is, you know, e to the power of the sum of these free energy contributions, then it's a harder computational uh, problem. I think you need uh, fancier algorithms to do that. So the first um, uh, approach that we developed um, 
meeting by Gabriela Martina in my lab uh, and in collaboration with Judith Krimmelbauer, who's also doing a lot of experiments in the lab, which is really taking these methods and while they're still being developed and applying them, uh, getting very interesting results. Um, and we're actually working on a, on a package now uh, that, that, that makes this available um, uh, to other people, and it builds on the bioconductor package for constructing these K-mer tables efficiently that we, deal with, that we already publish. This assumes there's one dominant binding site per probe, right? And then you can kind of go back to, to the, the previous situation, but it's, you know, the alignment is based on the affinity model, not based on some kind of sequence uh, feature, okay? Um, and what is, what is important about this is that it allows you to go um, over much larger ranges of base identity than the KMER models, right? The, the counts of KMERs in the Celex pool, they decrease as 1 over 4 to the power, you know, K, the length of the KMER. So, so there's a limit to how far you can go, and in practice it's about, you know, 12 base pairs, uh, right? But if you have such a feature-based model, there's no reason why you couldn't go over a much larger footprint to model uh, how affinity depends on the, uh, on the underlying sequence. Right? You still have to seed this with, with some you know, let's say most enriched rich camera. But then after that, it becomes a self-consistent problem. Now, the first application of this is something that we've been working on in collaboration with Miles Pufal uh, and his grad student Liang Zhang. Uh, uh, Miles and Liang have been using Celex seq on the energen and the glucocorticoid receptor. And if you look at the crystal structure of the AR and the GR, and you look at where the differences are in the, um, the amino acid identities, at the interface with the DNA, there's very little difference, right? So, and also the consensus in the field is that these factors bind to a 15 base pair binding site. That's kind of the same for the different family members, right? AR and GR have the same intrinsic specificity as the, um, as the believe, and um, any difference in their function is, is coming from cofactors that are specific to maybe to one of those factors. Now, if you look at their data with this kind of uh, 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 relative entropy kind of measure that we used in, in a salary paper, you see that there's a hint that there's a difference, that there's, you know, over a larger range of base pairs, there's information for the AR, a uh, larger range than for the glucocorticoid receptor. Uh, and I don't want to really explain this because I'm sh going to show the results in a more refined way uh, right now. This shows um, inferred delta delta Gs, free energy parameters, for all the possible base substitutions, single base substitutions, um, for the androgen receptor. Um, and what you see here is on the two axes is these delta delta Gs as inferred from two different rounds of the CELEX data that are independent of each other. Um, and we have error bars on these <coughs> delta delta Gs, and you can see that within the error, pretty much it's, it's very reproducible between rounds. So that's nice. We can actually you know, put confidence values on the inferred uh, free energies parameters. Um, um, and if you look in the flanks, this is basically e to the power of delta g, right? So this is the exponential version of these skills over here. But if you show them as an energy logo, um, where basically you read off the sequence here, and the, the scale is a free energy scale. This is actually something we introduced uh, w when we published the matrix reduce algorithm. Uh, and you know we, we like it. I think some other people also are starting to use it now. What you see here is that there's a difference between the flanks outside of this 15 base pair consensus between the AR, which I'm circling here, and the GR. The AR likes stretches of poly A um, that the GR doesn't care so much about. And if you think stretches of poly A, you think maybe the minor groove is narrowed, right? And if you look at the, the minor groove width profile using Rima Rosa's tools um, across this, this whole region, you see there's a dip outside of the 15 base pair region that seems to indicate you know, that there might be a minor groove interaction. And if we actually use our, our, our model to stratify sequences based on their affinity and then plot the minor groove width profile for different levels of affinity, you see this continuous trend that the more high affinity sequences that are shown in red here, they have this dip. And if you go down in affinity to the lower affinity sites, you lose that preference for the, for the narrow minor groove. Is that minor groove width inferred like Predictive stuff, or is that yeah, yeah, no, this is, this is just from his uh, table, DNA shape. Okay, so, of course, you know, you can make a, an observation like this in your model, but you want to validate it. And so one way in which uh, Miles and Liang validated this by doing uh, isothermal calorimetry measurements of, you know, for this complex, uh, so detailed um, measurements of, of separately uh, entropy and enthalpy uh, change uh, 
for a couple of different DNA sequences that either had or did not have these poly A um, tails. Um, and the nice thing is that because you can separately estimate the the entropic and the enthalpic effects in minor group rate interaction are believed to be based on the electrostatic interaction, and this indeed shows that it's mostly driven by enthalpy. So it's consistent with like an electrostatic readout, um, uh, you know, in this in the side of this binding site, uh, consistent with the, with the role for for readout of, of minor group with charges uh, through arginine side chains or other positively charged uh, side chains. Right. So this is like biophysical. Um, yeah, so it, it's not that large, but if you if you um, add up the delta G's over that whole flanking region, um, right, and then you say what is the full difference uh, between the highest and lowest, you know, uh, possible flank across all possibilities? That's like a tenfold range. Sure, but so, so why why is so small in this in this in this order? So that means that the A's are among strongest sequences. The A's are not that frequent, right? Well, these these are actually not frequency. This these are the delta delta G parameters that are fit in our model. So it's directly the the, the regression coefficient. Of it. Yeah. Well, this is definitely approximate because this was, you know, we, we're using a single base pair. But even within the context of this approximation, there's a more than tenfold uh, relative preference between AR and GR. So you can design two different sequences, right? And one is between those two sequences, the relative preference between GR and AR is tenfold difference between those two sequences, even you know, within this model fit. So this individual, you're saying that's, that's maybe one-tenth of a KT. Right, but you can, you know, for individual longer sequences. That can give you a KT of difference. Right, it can give you like a tenfold affinity difference between the two proteins binding, you know. It's like the ratio of ratios between the two factors, AR and GR, and the two different DNA sequences. I'm just trying to say how it matches the numbers, because you're saying that that full difference would mean that this is like 2 KT, right? Two to three, KT, two to three KT. Yeah. Yeah, well. You have to get two, and the height of each letter is maybe one tenth of a KT. Yeah. So you need like 20 letters on each side. Right. So, you know. It's, so the, the, the full sorbet, I was trying to kind of not spend too much time on this, but within the 50 base pair region, there are also differences between the two factors that are on the same order as the, as the differences in the flank. Right? And if you add up all those differences over the full binding side, you get to, uh, to about a tenfold difference. Um, okay, so this is direct biophysical uh, uh, follow-up on this on this prediction of the difference between the two factors. Uh, this is showing using CHIP-seq data from a, a, a modified prostate cancer cell line where these two factors are, are present. Uh, and you know, if you, if you think about this, how do you use CHIP data to validate this prediction? It's a little different from like doing an ROC curve because here we're not trying to show that these weight matrices by themselves are good at predicting hormone receptor binding sites. We're trying to validate something more subtle that the, the difference between the two models that we build for the two, type, two sets of Celex data, are actually, the difference is, is, is biologically meaningful in a in vivo context, right? So we fit a model essentially where we, you know, try to explain the, the chip enrichment, the peak height, in terms of, you know, scoring the sequence using these two different weight matrices. And then what is shown here is the regression coefficient for the AR weight matrix and the GR weight matrix. Right? And what you would like to see, which is shown over here for the GR chip data, that all the variation in peak height is explained by this GR, right? And that AR has, has little to, to add to that. Um, if you look at the chip data for AR, um, you know, we, we would have been very uh, happy if this would be a tall turquoise bar and, and, no, and no orange. It's not exactly that, right? And we're Somewhere between, uh, we're still trying to figure out exactly what this is, but it, it's known that in prostate cancer that the GR can take over from the AR and not conversely. So maybe that has something to do with that uh, asymmetry. Okay. So, so, this is, this actually, so this is chip seek, right? This is chip seek, yeah. So, so you're saying that in, in, in the 
the cells, they do bind very different Yeah, they bind different regions, and that you know you, the difference between these weight matrices is really uh, useful for capturing the in vivo targeting by these two different factors. Carmen, you're not accounting for any cofactor that bind. No, there are cofactors there, like FOXA1, <laughs> right? Uh, but they're not in this. I'm not taking those into account here. Yeah, we're trying to see how much can we explain just in terms of the intrinsic binding preference or the difference between the two factors. Uh, right? But of course, cofactors are always, always uh, you know, going to be part of what, in the end, determines all this specificity. Um, so the other uh, algorithm that we've developed um, and we're um, right now you know, trying to, to wrap up is, um, is a, a, a maximum likelihood framework that deals with this sliding window in an exact way. And it, it really, in a model, sums up all the possible offsets and then tries to fit the the, the coefficient for all the features. Um, this is numerically a hard problem. For instance, the deep learning methods are more like the, the previous algorithm, uh, right? But if you have this kind of mix of summing and, and, and taking products, uh, uh, it took a while to get this under control, even though conceptually it's pretty uh, simple, but numerically to make it work, uh, it was actually not uh, straightforward. The nice thing is we can just start with all the delta delta g's equal to zero, maybe fit a weight matrix or add shape parameters. Um, and then we just go downhill in the, in the log likelihood function and, and we'll get our uh, model fit. And just to show how this works for on the, the slattery data, you know, the Hox EXD data from our uh, uh, paper with Richard Mann and, and Remo and Barry a couple of years ago, and this is actually a crystal structure, a, a nice rendering of it, a crystal structure from Joshi et al. Uh, uh, by um, Carolina in, in, in Remo's lab. You see the EXD cofactor here in complex with the Hox protein, SCR in this case, right? And what's happening here in the middle of the, of the binding site is that there's these arginine side chains positively charged that are interacting with the minor groove here. Um, and what I'm showing here in the next slide is um, um, model fit using this uh, maximum likelihood uh, framework of a single base pair uh, uh, base feature model together with uh, a coefficient for minor groove width readout across this binding site. Um, and what you see here is a fit to the monomer data, which, which is actually part of the slattery paper. Uh, but with the monomer data, because the motif is short and not very um, um, information content rich, um, it's actually hard to do the alignment of the sequences. You know, the only way to analyze this data is with this kind of model that we developed. And so what you can see here is you've lined up this monomer motif uh, from our uh, fit with the fit on the uh, on the on the heterodimer data, um, you know you can this this is really uh, modeling how the Hox protein itself is interacting with DNA and the corresponding shape um, uh, fits together with the error bars and we also have error bars on the on the letter heights if you like in this model fit right. What you see is what happens in the context of the heterodimer that there is a suddenly a, a strong preference for a narrow minor groove here uh, in between the two homeo domains. Uh, which is you know, consistent with, with uh, what was seen in the crystal structure and also what we previously uh, reported in, 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 in these papers uh, that we published. Um, so, can uh -huh. can you say, what are actually the features that are in this sort of effective energy model? Right. So it's the letter at every position? Yeah, it's, but there are additional things. What are the additional well, things? It's, so it's, it's whether you have a certain letter at some position relative to the, the footprint of the factor. Uh, and it could be a shape parameter like minor groove width at every position within the binding site and over an arbitrary it. range. Those two things. Okay. Yeah, that's it. Okay, so I wanted to wrap up by, by showing uh, some data um, or a result um, also for EXT Hawks, um, in this case for um, 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 uh, the, you know, for, it's, uh, this is actually a complex with, uh, with deformed, I think. Um, yeah, here we go. Uh, and this experiment was done by Judith uh, Kribbelbauer in my lab. Um, and we, we got to this conclusion using some of the, 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 the GLM uh, approximate methods that we developed uh, with Gabriella. Um, and this really came out of a project on full-length homothorax where, you know, if you see, here's a third protein that in a different splice form has a homeo domain. So you really get three different homeo domains that are forming a complex together. And we, we've done a lot of work on this uh, that Judith is going to present at Cold Spring Harbor uh, next week. But 
like a side um, uh, 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 result of this project it was pretty striking is that when we used this to, to analyze the binding by this complex, we discovered that the N-terminal arm of EXD, so not of Hox, in the previous crystal structure, I was showing how the N-terminal arm of the Hox protein is reading out uh, the minor groove to the left of the Hox domain, and that's in between the two homeo domains over here, right? Um, but now what you see in this picture is that um, that's the N-terminal arm of, of extra denticle is also reading out the binder groove here outside of the, we consider to be the complete binding site over 12 base pairs. Uh, and the interesting thing is that this would never come out of the, the analyses that we had done uh, so far because they were limited to, the, to this uh, horizon of, of 12 base pairs. Um, uh, and what, what the model fits told us that there, there was a minor groove width readout here uh, to the left of the extra identical domain. So that the N-terminal arm, not only of the Hox protein, but also of extra identical, uh, which is binding with Hox in a kind of tandem configuration, was also reading out minor groove width. Uh, here you see that interaction in a, in a crystal structure. Um, and the striking thing was that if you mutate this arginine, which is something that, that Judith did, and she even ran Selex seq follow-up experiments using these mutant proteins in a, you know, when the third homeodomain was present, uh, but if that homeodomain is not there of, homo, of, of homothorax, the third factor, this mutation of the arginine in the internal R completely kills binding of the EXD uh, Hox uh, dimer. Um, and what you see in this gel is the effect of a couple of different mutations to the EXD protein. Um, and in the right uh, column here is the asparagin 51, which is the core residue that recognizes the AT of the, of the homeodomain, the, the alpha-3 helix, right, which completely kills binding. Um, if you mutate either arginine 5 or arginine 2 in the N-terminal arm, that also completely kills binding, which was completely unexpected uh, for us, right? And again, if you have that third protein to kind of stabilize things, then you can form a complex, but the, the EXD and homeodomain uh, uh, protein by themselves, um, they are no longer able to bind uh, um, uh, to, the, to the DNA if you, even with a single base pair mutation. Okay, so I just want to thank uh, all the, the people in my lab who contributed to this, and of course our collaborators, uh, Richard and Remo and, and Miles, and uh, people in their lab. And I've already acknowledged the various people in my lab with the different results that I saw. Thank you for your attention. For the ARGL comparison, mm -hmm. uh, can your models predict the binding affinities or? Yes, I mean, the slide with the chip, you can show um, the, um, Well, the models are designed to predict affinities, right? So they predict total delta, the binding free energy. And there's like KD10 for one, by one protein and KD5 yeah. for the other. Right, so once you fit them, you can add up the coefficients for any sequence and get a prediction of the relative affinity of that sequence. Right? It's just parameterized by those features. And that, you know, that itself, of course, it's the same model that, you know, that, that Remo and Martha and Raluca and everybody has been using, right? And you guys, I guess, right, it's, what is different is the, the way we estimate those parameters, right? And we think we can go over a larger range uh, and maybe uh, get more accurate estimates of, of you know, as, as far as capturing low affinity sites, which are particularly interested in getting right. I'm just trying to get a very qualitative sense of sort of you use this model and then go and predict chip C. How good is the agreement? Kind of very ballpark. So what fraction of sites are, have high affinity, I think, like occupied, and what fraction of occupied sites have high affinity? So what's the overlap between them? Yeah, I think that the standard way to compare is using ROC curves, kind of measured, where you, you know, you say, I know. So uh, that's, 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 that's good, right? It tells you and you can compare different models. But, but really, uh, I think uh, it's a great question. Like, you want to use these motif models to make functional predictions, right? And you would want to make quantitative predictions of what the factor is doing in the cell. So, um, so we are actually working on an extension of this to, to fit the chip-seq data as well in a quantitative way, right? Um, and, and maybe that will allow us to more directly compare these uh, delta yeah, Gs. So imagine you have a good given uh, delta G uh, way of computing delta G of binding. How good will be an agreement between 
what we, we take this using super accurate, super exact delta delta G. Uh, uh, delta G is a computing function. Right. Affinity computing function and the actual occupants. So, is, is, so are all high occupancy sites occupied 10% of high occupancy? Yeah. Trying to get a sense, because anybody, if anybody knows this, it should be. Yeah, it's a very, it's, you know, and, and we, we are very interested in the question. I think if you say occupancy um, enrichment in a chip experiment, it's a different thing, right? So, and it, you can only measure occupancy indirectly, so that's the first problem, right? And the best predictor of a chip seek experiment for factor X in, in cell line Y is the average of all the other chip seek experiments in cell line Y, right? So, so. So I think predicting actual even enrichment or occupancy right from the sequence is a very hard problem. I think what we are trying to focus on is um, trying to predict the relative binding by different closely related family members. And if we can do that and maybe use DNA seq as part of your capturing the, the you know the, the chromatin context or other you know chromatin uh, markers that that would uh, that'd be fine. But you know I think. Uh, predicting chip seq data from the sequence from scratch, that's a very hard problem. It's probably even unsolvable. Right. So, so on this slide, so the, the green one is, is what's the... This is the, so this says, you know, Y chip enrichment equals beta blue times the affinity for cell in the AR plus some other regression coefficient beta orange times the weight matrix score for AR. And these are the betas from that model. All right. Well, thanks all the speakers from this morning session. It's now